Hello baseball fans and welcome to episode 4 of the British Baseball Podcast. Today I am joined by the fantastic uh, Josh Chetwind and I've had a great time talking to him. We must have been chatting for about a quarter of an hour before we started recording and a bit longer after as well. Um, absolutely brilliant storyteller, really enjoyed my time talking to him and I really hope that you enjoy listening to the stories that he has to tell. Um, as per usual, you can reach me, your host Matthew, on the social medias at Brit Baseball Pod, or email the show British Baseball Podcast at gmail.com and I'll always try my best to get back to you uh, if you ask any questions or if you want to uh, provide any feedback for the show. Your opinions are truly appreciated and your constructive criticisms are also taken on board. Uh, so without further ado, let's get into it. So I'd like to welcome um, to the show a very special guest, uh, a man who I remember from a past on TV. It's the British Baseball Hall of Famer, Josh Chetwind. Josh, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Matt. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. No problem. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming on and uh, agreeing to tell some stories. Um, so for those that probably aren't familiar with yourself, would you like to tell us a bit about uh, you and your involvement in the British game? Sure. It's uh, It's been a number of decades now. Uh, I was born in the UK, despite uh, what the accent may suggest to you. Uh, grew up, though, in the United States. I played uh, NCAA Division I college baseball at a school called Northwestern University in the Big Ten, uh, and then played uh, one season of independent minor league baseball in the Frontier League. And I thought I'd be one of those classy players who, when I got released or my career ended professionally, that I would just hang them up. I was not one of those classy players because I loved the sport vastly too much. So I kept on playing uh, just sort of in local leagues. And a few years after I was released, I was working as a journalist and came across the website for the British Baseball Federation. And I was intrigued. This was 1995. And I wrote to Kevin McAdam, who was the vice president of the BBF at the time, and said, I didn't know there was British baseball. Uh, Here's my background. Turned out we had a, a mutual contact. And uh, Kevin invited me out to uh, play with the Great Britain national team in the 1996 European B-Pool Championships, which were held in Hull and Hessel. And I went out there. We did really well. I was lucky enough to have a really good tournament. And we won the gold medal at those Euros to be elevated into the top tier of European baseball, the A-Pool. And uh, from there, I played in uh, four additional European championships over the span of 10 years. So I was on the Great Britain national team for 10 years, uh, serving as the team captain for, for a portion of that. And because I was coming out and playing for the national team, but uh, was not living in the UK, I started to feel quite a bit of guilt about that. I didn't think it was quite fair to just sort of interlope and and just sort of show up for these big tournaments and get to represent the country. So my wife and I made the decision to move to the UK and uh, did that in 2001. I got a job working for Major League Baseball. I'd worked as a journalist previously. And so I started doing communications for Major League Baseball in their London office. And I had had some experience doing television at that point because I had uh, worked as uh, a reporter uh, for USA Today, which was a large publication. I would often be asked to go on television and chat about the subject that I I covered, which was the entertainment industry. So I had some experience and there was an opening to be the co-host or really, you know, sort of the analyst or it's not really a summarizer job there because it was a studio show, but uh, the commentator on uh, MLB on five, uh, on channel five. And I went for an open tryout uh, with Johnny Gould, who was the longtime host for that show. Uh, I joked about the fact that I heard he was a dodgy softball player. And so we had chemistry (laughs) right away and uh, ended up getting that job. And so I did that for a number of years. Uh, Among the other things I've done with British baseball is I've written uh, a couple of books and, and done quite a bit of historical research Uh, on British baseball. I wrote a book called, uh, co-authored a book called uh, British Baseball in the West Ham Club. And then I followed that up with a book called Baseball in Europe, a Country by Country History, where I did a chapter devoted to Great Britain baseball. So that's sort of the overview. I've worked uh, in European baseball in a number of other ways as well, but that's sort of uh, the cuss or the the overview. Uh, The only other thing to add was that I I played uh, in the uh, National Baseball League in the UK for 
parts of six seasons. I won three national championships. I started uh, the senior side for the London Mets. When we won the national championship the first two years uh, that I helped create that team. And obviously it's gone on to be a very successful program and gone leaps and bounds beyond whatever I did to, to help start that. Uh, and then I was also a, a member of the Bracknell Blazers in their only national championship. Wow, good work. Good work. <laughs> so it sounds like you've had um, quite a, a varied and interesting career. Uh, what are your sort of favorite memories um, from like your playing days and and your broadcasting? I, I love playing for the national team. It was such an honor to wear Britain on my chest, uh, to represent a country in international play. Uh, I, every Euro cycle that I played in, the standard got better. But the first year I played for GB in 1996 when we won the European B pool was a particularly special memory for me. The reason being is that team was almost exclusively made up of players who played domestic baseball in the UK. That would change over time where increasingly more and more players who were British passport holders but lived abroad would fill out the roster. But in that first team that I played for, it was just myself and one other player and every other member of that team were truly born bred British players. So you were really getting a great view of where development was for British baseball. Those players purely played for the love of the game. We beat the Czech Republic in the finals. It was just a great first experience. I always sort of wonder if it hadn't been such a great experience whether I would have thrown myself headlong into being involved with British baseball, but I'm so grateful for that. Domestically, the first national championship uh, I won with the London Mets, we beat the Croydon Pirates in the uh, best of three final. And that was particularly special because of the three national championship teams I played for, it was the team that had the least amount of talent. But we were also playing against the Croydon Pirates team that had gone undefeated in the regular season. They were looking to have a completely undefeated year. Probably one of the best teams in recent memory. So we were the vast underdog in that. And there's nothing more exciting in any sport than being the underdog and coming through and, and winning something. And so that was particularly special from a playing standpoint. And then off the field, no doubt my whole experience with Channel 5, working with Johnny Gould, working with uh, Eric Jansen, who was our producer over that period, David Langell, for people who watch the show, just a lovely human being. It was just a special group of people who loved baseball so much. Um, we would do the show, of course, at nights. So, uh, you know, you had that sort of slap happy experience. There was almost sort of a garage band vibe to it. Uh, that whole experience was just incredibly special. So I, I, I can't, you know, it's almost picking from your children who your favorite is. There, there's so many experiences in my British baseball career uh, that, that make me smile on a daily basis. Good. That's that's good. Um, they got all those happy memories for me. And I, I don't mean about the, the late night on the on the show. I, I was. It's probably one of the reasons why I ended up sort of drifting away from from baseball, from being a casual fan. It was just a time, and like I was at college at the time, and it was um, just became harder and harder to stay awake from the from the late nights. Yeah, we always joked that you know we had a handful of core demographics. It was you know college students coming home from the pub, uh, mothers who were feeding their newborns, uh, night watchmen, uh, and that sort of made up the, the large portion of our viewership. But we also had some insomniacs. The people who watched that show are, it was so special to me too because they had such a, a love and support for the work that we did. Uh, and there was such an enthusiasm. I always consider us very lucky that we did it before the era of social media, where there wasn't sort of the concept of trolls. I'm sure if we were doing it today, you would have the haters who would just choose something and they might choose our show to be, you know, sort of their stepping off point to, to be critical of something. But back then, if just everyone who watched it, if you chose to stay up and make that commitment, uh, you were vested in it. And so there was a lot of love for the sport and a lot of love for us. It was it was a brilliant time. Yeah, it sounds like it as well. Um, yeah, the, the chemistry and everything, it was just, it was the best. And it, so it was a shame to see it go when it finally, finally went. But 
Yeah, it's not really a lot we can we can do about it. If it was, if it was me running the show, it would uh, still be on now. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, you know, there was an economic downturn at that point. It was right after Lehman Brothers had folded and, uh, you know, there was sort of worldwide economic slump. And so Channel 5 decided to go in a different direction. I think what I lament so much about its demise was that it was such a great entry point for people to learn about baseball and watch it. The way it's set up now, if you already love baseball, you can go and get your BT Sport. You can choose to get MLB TV. There are certainly more outlets now to follow baseball if you have an enthusiasm for it as a foundation. But if you don't and you don't know the sport, you're probably not going to invest the money to try and learn the sport. And that was what was so brilliant about baseball being on terrestrial TV is that you can happen upon the game be interested and ultimately get hooked. And, and that's something that I feel that the UK misses now to a certain extent, is that you don't have that free opportunity, that shop window to just take a look and then fall in love. Yeah, yeah, yeah true, I agree. Um, have you ever had the chance to sort of be a part of the World Series with your journalism? Yeah, I, I covered a number of World Series. so. I started doing the show in 2002, and then in 2003, I had this absurdly vain desire to go to law school back in the United States. It was something that I always wanted to do. I didn't even want to practice law per se, but I really wanted to go to law school. I wanted that education. I sort of feel like in a secular society, that is sort of the, the way you learn about what our morals are. I had all these sort of beliefs. So when I went back, I continued to work for Channel 5 doing packages, both during spring training and the World Series. And through that, I also got a job being the summarizer for live broadcasts of the World Series for BBC. So I would do, before the game, I would interview players, I would do a few packages for the Channel 5 show, and then when the game started, I would go into the radio booth uh, with Simon Brotherton, who is a fantastic broadcaster, and the two of us would broadcast the games. So for me, the, the highlight of that was the 2004 World Series um, for People who are sort of new fans to baseball, you may not realize that was a very red letter year for World Series. It was the year that the Boston Red Sox broke what was called the Curse of the Bambino. The Red Sox had not won a World Series since 1918, and they won in 2004. And I, I'd grown up a Red Sox fan for a whole host of very weird reasons, even though I didn't grow up in Boston. And so to have the opportunity to be on the call when the Red Sox broke that curse for the BBC, it was just, it blew my mind. It was really sort of very, very special. Then when I came back, obviously, to do the studio show again after I finished law school, um, you know, we, of course, broadcast World Series. It was so much fun with Johnny Gould. We would dress up, uh, you know, in black tie for the first game of the World Series. So that was very special, too. So, yeah, both on-site, I did, I think, five World Series on-site. Uh, and then a whole host of them in the studio show. Lovely. Um, so have you got any funny stories that you can tell us or any interesting, um, any interesting things from interviewing players or, or coaches? Yeah, I mean, I always got to do a lot of interviews, but it was always really difficult to pull away players. I remember negotiating with an MLB official who had worked on the TV side for MLB, and they needed uh, a sort of certain interview with one of the players before the series started and I happened to have that interview set up and they were they asked me hey if you do this x question for me I can't remember what the question was I will help you once the world series starts to pull out a couple of players this was in 2004 and I was like great deal so I negotiated that did my part of it and then during the world series I was able just before the start of the game to interview Albert Pujols before one game and then Johnny Damon before oh, the Red Sox were up three games to nil uh, right before they played the fourth game. So that was really exciting uh, to get those two interviews because it was always very difficult. Uh, you couldn't really pull away players, but it was a lot of fun to be on the field right before a World Series starts. 
it's a different energy. I mean, I've been on the field. We used to do a road trip as part of Channel 5. Uh, and so you'd be on the field before games in a normal game. It's fun to be there. But the energy to be on the field right before World Series game starts, when batting practice is happening, some of the fans are coming in. Uh, it, it's a very unique energy, only to be matched by the workout day at the London Series last year, which to me is the only thing that trumps that because you had people in there who were seeing baseball for the first time and it had a World Series atmosphere for them. So that's the only one that probably trumps it. But other than that, the experience being the World Series, being at old Yankee Stadium at a World Series or Fenway Park, um, very special. Yeah, yeah, you've, you've, you've probably um, lived many um, sort of baseball in dream for, for myself and and lots of other people listening out there. It's I, I can only imagine the sights and the sounds that you you've encountered. It's um, it's one of the things I, I I literally could listen to people talk about baseball for for days. I, I don't know what it is about. I don't get it about any other sport, but people talking about their um their their love and passion for baseball and the stories that they tell. It's 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 just um something that I, yeah that I really enjoy. Yeah, I, the the ballpark atmosphere is is very special to me. And you know, clearly, I've been yeah, you know, I've been to Test cricket, I've been to you know footy matches, you know, premier premiership matches. I've been to American football, hockey, basketball, and they all have their spe you know special experiences. And they're all very different. And uh, baseball, there's sort of a warmth, almost a family atmosphere there when you go to a baseball game, uh, especially if you've gone in your youth um, that sort of always brings you back. There's sort of this twinge of nostalgia always when you're at a baseball game, something about the pacing of it that's just right. It's not too slow, it's not too fast. Uh, it's just the right rhythm uh, that I think makes it unique. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, it's, sometimes you can see it off, off the TV and it's, I, I don't know, even even like the small grounds, like uh, like in Manchester, when I go to the Manchester ground, and it's just a few people sat on chairs, just enjoying the game. There's just something about that sort of environment as well. It's it doesn't feel oh, how can I say it? There's just it just has this certain vibe about it. It's like a like a connectivity with between you and the person that sat next to you that you're just there to appreciate and enjoy and just just take it in. I think that's particularly true in in the UK because anyone who's out there really wants to be out there. Um, there's sort of a, a, a in, an ingrained enthusiasm, both players and people who go out to spectate for baseball there. It's not something, I mean, people, I know stories of people who have happened upon baseball in the UK and sort of sat down and kind of got interested watching the game. That certainly does occur. Uh, but to come back on a regular basis, there is a, a, a family family relationship that you start to have with the people who love baseball. It's sort of that unique connection that really galvanizes relationships. I see that definitely with the fans in the UK. All the supporter groups are amazing there. Um, but and I'm talking about fans of the MLB game. But the people who come and watch the domestic game, I mean, they get a special thumbs up for me. And, you know, the hope always with those people is that that's going to transition into them either playing baseball or playing softball. Because as much as it's an enjoyable game to watch, I think it is exponentially more enjoyable to, to play and to try. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think this is um, where I'm going to wrap up my questions and throw up some of the uh, the listener questions as well. Uh, oh, but before before I do that, uh, what, what have you got on for uh, 2020? What are your sort of goals and, and projects you're working on this year? So I, uh, I will be... I mean, it's tentatively set, but this is the first time saying it publicly. I'm expected to go back out and do the second London series uh, with Darren Fletcher and the BT Sports team, uh, the Cubs cards series that will be out there in June. So I'm really looking forward to that. Last year was such a special experience. The games were amazing. They weren't your sort of typical baseball games, but they were special in their own way. And so uh, I hope that that will be the same case this year. Uh, otherwise, I've sort of transitioned to a large extent away from sports. Uh, I Now my primary job is I work for a large uh, US national advocacy group that works on environmental issues. So uh, I work on a lot of uh, issues, policy issues relating to climate change and things of that nature, sort of to try and 
you know, race climate action, stuff like that. So uh, I have two young kids. I have a 13 year old and nine year old and those sort of issues resonate a lot with me. So that's what I've, I've been working on over the last year and uh, will continue to do so for the near future at least. But they're giving me the time off to go out for the London series. So I'm, I'm, I'm very enthused about that. Lovely. That's great. Um, so Ian, uh, Ian Bleese has messaged in. He's the general manager of the Liverpool Trojans. Uh, his question is, um, he had the pleasure of being in charge of the Preston Stingers for your first ever game in British baseball. What are your honest, what were your honest first impressions of the game in the UK after that day? Well, first off, I just want to say I have a lot of respect for Ian. I know how much work he's done for, for British baseball and baseball in Liverpool, which is one of historically the great hubs of, of British baseball. So uh, thank you, Ian, for the question. I absolutely remember that game in Enfield against the London Warriors at the start of the 2002 season. I, I was being a little cheeky because I was going to play for Bracknell that season because it was obviously a lot closer than Preston. But the season for Bracknell started a little later. Their game, they didn't have a game that first week. So I agreed to play for Preston for just that first game. And then I get you get a one-time transfer and I was going to transfer to Bracknell. So I played in that game and I, I, I pitched and hit. I had a, quite a good game. I, I won't go into details, but I played pretty well. Uh, and it was a close game. But what really struck me about that was that the Preston team had come down all the way from up north to be a part of the National League. And unfortunately, the team, as the season progressed, would end up folding uh, despite their greatest intentions. And it was sort of my first eye into one of the difficulties with British baseball is the, the, the regional split and how difficult it is for teams up in the north and teams down in the south to regularly play each other. There's just not, you know, the financial wherewithal to make that happen. and and sort of a shame for that because the players who played for Preston on that team and then, you know, I've played against Liverpool, I know, in uh, one of the semifinals for the NBL, they would always have to come down south. But it, it, it's just, you want to see the best players play each other from all across the country. And I know there have been some difficulty to make that happen. And my great hope is that um, the people up north and people down south will figure out a way uh, to make that work, both in terms of just seeing eye to eye on how British baseball should run and also figuring out a way to, to just make it financially and logistically work. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, I'd like to see a big all-star weekend with um, like the best players from each, like the, the Southwest Baseball League, um, Scotland Baseball, the British Baseball League, Baseball Federation, Baseball, and just, and um, all the other ones. Sorry if I forgot if I've mentioned Julie, but I'd, I'd love to see just like two days a neutral sort of ground and just getting loads of people down and just a really great display of baseball. I think that's why I'd, I, I'd like I, to see. I, I like that as well. I know there've been some, I, I know there've been some cup games that have brought in, in fact, outside of the UK brought in a team from Ireland um, and then Scotland and some other teams uh, have played in that as well too. I also know there've been some select side sort of, but only NBL players who played against GB squads. But I like your idea. I think it would be great to have a, a real cross section. And that's something that it used to occur a lot more. You mentioned, we discussed before we started on this, how baseball was quite large in the 1930s. There, was, there were professional leagues uh, throughout the UK during that period. And those sort of all-star games or teams from both sides, top teams playing each other as sort of more of a spectacle uh, occurred quite a bit during that period. Yeah. Um. Well, sorry, I forgot to ask you, what, what position did you used to play? In, um... I, I was a catcher for almost all of my career. Then I had a pretty nasty collision at home plate, uh, blew out my knee, rehabbed, went back to catching because it was the one thing I was reasonably okay at. And I played that position for most of the time on the GB national team. After I needed a second knee surgery, I went where catchers go to die, which is first base. <laughs> I played sort of the end, the last few years of my career, and I think the last, definitely the last year I was, I only played first base. I think the second to last year I was, I split time between catching and first base because I just didn't, uh, you know, physically couldn't handle it. It was a real shame because before I had that collision, I was very durable behind the plate. Uh, I loved catching. 
I mean, it, it's what really got me excited about the game because you're involved in the strategy throughout, right? You're you're calling the game for the pitcher. Uh, you're in on every play. The catcher sees the field in a completely different way than any other player on the field. Uh, I just, it, it's what made me happy playing baseball was uh, catching. And first base was fine. I loved the game so much that I was okay to play there at the end of my career. But once I couldn't catch anymore, it certainly was uh, heartbreaking for me. So have you got any tips for any uh, young wannabe catchers that might be listening to the show? Yeah, catching is a great position because if you're not a natural athlete, but you work really hard at the craft of catching, you can actually make yourself into someone who uh, is a player who's wanted. I was a pretty good high school level uh, baseball player, but not amazing. I went off to college, uh, but because I could catch, and because I worked really hard at it, I earned a spot on my college team, improved enough to play professionally for a brief period. And I was never the best athlete on my team, never even close to it. Um, but I worked hard at it. I was a good receiver, so I, I caught pretty well. I had an okay arm. Um, and so that's the great thing about catching, which is find someone who knows the game and they're what is great about Great Britain baseball, there are people out there who know catching really well. Will Lintern, if it's in a name that people are listening to your show, no, seek him out. I know he does uh, a lot of academy type stuff, uh, but he is just a really great coach of catchers. Uh, he sort of came on right after I was done catching. Uh, and once you learn the mechanics of it, and you work really hard at it. It's a position more than anything. You know, shortstop, you need to be athletic. Center fielder, you just need to be naturally athletic. Catcher, you can give up a little athleticism for hard work, sweat and toil, and sweat equity. I've um, I've spoken to Will as well. And he's agreed to come on in the next couple of weeks and, and have a chat about his new position as the catching and, and pitching coordinator at GB. So it should be a interesting chat with him too yeah he's a great guy he's devoted a lot to British baseball I know I'm old because people who are sort of kids when I started Will Lintern Liam Carroll who's the head of the national team they all hold these sort of large positions in GB baseball which is very very gratifying to me because it shows that the sport is continuity from generation to generation the people who are my age now have sort of moved on uh, to a large extent, and that next generation, their baseball playing careers are over, but they're staying with baseball and being involved in it. And you, you just need that to continue generation after generation. One thing that you notice in British baseball, and this is true in baseball across Europe, is that when baseball is still in its formative years, really the best players uh, from generation to generation tend to be the kids of those first players who got interested in the sport. Uh, the Marshall family is an example of that. Uh, Gavin Marshall is probably the best born uh, and reared player for British baseball. Uh, he ended up playing college baseball in the U.S. after really, uh, in, in junior college baseball, after really learning his baseball uh, in the Hull area and then went on to play uh, minor league baseball. His dad, Barry Marshall, was also a player. His dad's dad, his grandfather was a baseball player. And so that's great. And that's really important. That creates some continuity. But what you want to start seeing are also people who didn't have that relationship getting involved with baseball and then their families getting involved because then you just have a broader sort of uh, group of people who fall into that criteria. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything that British baseball can learn from European baseball? Because you've, you've written a book on um, European baseball, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as as mentioned, I wrote a book called uh, Baseball in Europe, a Country by Country History. I actually wrote the original version of that, the first edition in 2008. And I had a second edition that I worked insanely hard on uh, come out uh, right at the end of 2019. So just a few months ago that updated all the histories for over 40, more than 40 European uh, baseball countries. The reality is, is that in terms of the national team, Great Britain is definitely hanging. Uh, we've been in the A pool since basically 1997, right after we were elevated. We've dropped down a couple of times, but then immediately got elevated again. So I don't think we've even missed an A pool European championship over that stretch of time. But a lot of that is reflective of the players that we recruit who have British passports who don't play in the domestic program. 
And so when you look at it more from the domestic program, the reality is, is that Great Britain is a little bit behind those other teams that sit in the A pool of European baseball. I think one element that sort of reflects that is that you'll have countries like Moldova uh, or um, Poland who are, are lesser baseball lights, but have had players who have come out of their domestic programs who have been signed by major league teams. We're still waiting for our first player who is born, raised, reared, learns their baseball in the UK, gets signed by a major league team to get that sort of talent sort of coursing through the veins of British baseball. How does that happen? I think some of the elements are now in place. Good coaching, a massive part of it. I mean, you have not only people like Liam Carroll and Will Lintern, but you have people at the club level. Drew Spencer, who's the coach of the London Mets, tremendous baseball background. You know, he's the type of person who you want to replicate in a lot of different locations. So increasing that's very important. It's a broken record, but if you build it, the line from Field of Dreams, if you build it, he will come. But if you build it, they will come is sort of the way it's uh, colloquially used. And basically what that means is the more infrastructure, the more high-end fields that you have in the UK, the more people are going to be drawn to the sport and excited about playing. You know, it's tough when you show up for a game and you're putting up a snow fence in the outfield and trying to make your field not be undulating so much that you get these bad hops. Great fields bring in more players to get excited about the sport. Farnham Park is great. I know there's been discussion of a better facility in Manchester. I know the people up north, Ken McAdam, folks up there are, are also sort of aiming for, for better facilities. They've had them in the past over their history. So I think infrastructure is a huge part of it as well, too. I think those the combination of uh, in a lot of coaching and infrastructure are very key, and then uh, infrastructure in club structure is very important. What ends up happening a lot with a lot of clubs is that you get someone who gets very enthusiastic about baseball, works very hard at it for three, four years, maybe even a decade, builds a great program, and then they either lose interest, they get into some squabble over politics with British baseball, or they simply have a family or get distracted, and then they walk away, and there's no second level. There's no second team of people who have the same level of interest, the same level of ability to keep that program going. That has happened over and over again. I could give examples. I don't want to call anyone out, but of people who got very excited about baseball in the UK, were very involved for a while, and then sort of moved on their way, and the programs that they started basically fell apart. So having a depth of interest uh, and a depth of people who are willing to work for a individual club is paramount. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Jim, as um, as messaged in, Jim from Bradford, um, he's one of the guys that I play fancy baseball with, so he sent a, a few in for you. Um, I'm going to try and make this into one question. Uh, he's asked, um, if you had to give one tip for how to become a better player, what would it be? And also, if you could do it all again, if you could model your game on one player, past or present, who would it be? Okay, uh, hard questions. One tip is very difficult. Uh, you know, I I would can I do two because really there are two things that have to go hand yeah, in hand. Yeah, yeah. Good coaching. Seek out someone who really knows the game and you trust knows the game who can really give you very good advice. It's not enough to practice if you don't have people who are helping you hone your skills. But second is put in the time, uh, practice. It's not just about going out on a Saturday and playing in games. You need to put in the time uh, to strengthen the muscles, to learn to repeat mechanics. So good coaching and a lot of practice. If you do those two things, you will become at the worst, a serviceable baseball player. But more likely, if you have any athletic skill, you will become a, a good baseball player. You need to have patience though. It doesn't happen overnight. Baseball is not a sport where you can really pick it up you know, immediately. There are some people who are naturals at it, but they are very few and very far between. between. So I guess if we we're gonna throw in a third one, it would be be patient. So coaching and practice are intertwined and then patience would be third. Yeah, I think patience is something I need to 
learn a bit from as well. Like I've only had my fourth session today, third or fourth session. Yeah. And um, there's so much to take in that. I mentioned it at the start of the show uh, when, I, when I finished just to sort of recap what I've been through. And like we've been doing, um, I got involved in the pitching side because I wanted to try and increase my aim accuracy. And it was all over the place. It was like Stormtrooper fire. Um, <laughs> It was, yeah, it was just, um, it, it, was, it was a really good session, but I found it quite stressful because I really want to to do well at it. And so I think I've sort of maybe put a bit of pressure on myself. Um, but the, the the coaching I received um, today was, was really, like I said, then listen to your coaches and get good coaching, like uh, even stuff down to like change my hand grip slightly, raising my elbow with my batting um, and, and my swing. Uh, it completely... I was, I was actually getting real contact and hitting the ball really far. Um, and same with the pitching, when I was talking to a coach about pitching, it's just like just changing and tweaking little mechanics here and there. Um, maybe it's just the way I'm standing or the release of my ball when I'm throwing. Um, yeah, it's it just just got to you know, take my time and, and take it a bit easier. I think, well, not take it easy, but like focus on one bit when I'm trying to make it all, all glue and, and work all together. Yeah, and I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head with the, the last statement you made, uh, which is that focus on one thing at a time, and particularly if you're older and you're taking up baseball. And I actually have reasonable insight in this. As a 43, 44-year-old, I took up the sport of curling the, with the rocks and the Olympics. Uh, and, you know, you can intellectualize all the different mechanical elements that you need to master in order to be good at that sport. And this is very applicable to baseball too, but it is nearly impossible to master them all at once. So what you need to do is to, each time you go out to a training with baseball, especially if you're older, um, is pick one thing to work on, pick one thing to improve at a time, try and make that as good as possible. And sometimes it's difficult because so when you're talking about throwing, you know, keeping your front side closed, getting your, you know, your arm up in the right slot, getting the right release point, you having your lower body have a transfer of weight at the right time. In a way, they're all intertwined. So it's sometimes very hard to just focus on one because they all sort of touch upon each other. But to the extent that you can do that, really try and focus on one because if you try and focus on two or three, you end up doing all of them sort of second rate instead of really trying to improve one element and then going on to the next one and the next one. And there's so many ways in which you can improve elements. One issue I had a lot of uh, was uh, when I was a hitter, when I was young, was my bat drifting out. When you load your bat back, you need to load it straight back and not crazy far back. It's a very subtle movement. And I had a tendency to let my hands drift out away from my body. So I would be in school and I would just stand there, not worry about my legs, but just do the movement of getting my hands back into that position. I wasn't hitting. I was just literally at school with my books. I'd put my book back down and I would just do it for five minutes so that I could really mentally lock in what it took to get my hands back in the right position when I was swinging the bat. And you can do that. You don't have to have a ball and be at training to do that, to work on trying to get the right, right release point. You can sort of just go through the, the dry movement of, of throwing a ball to try and figure out where that right release point is for you. So there's so many ways to work on it, but taking them one at a time would be my biggest tip in terms of dealing with what you were talking about. Good tip. Thank, Thank you very much. Very much. Okay, um, so as we sort of wrap the show, uh, there's one question I like to sort of ask um, the people I'm bringing on is that I don't actually follow a Major League Baseball team at the moment. So I'm sort of asking people to give me their best pitch on uh, why I should follow uh, the team you support. You mentioned before that you're a Red Sox fan. Uh, Kevin McAdam that I had on last week is also a Red Sox fan and he told me I should support the Mets. Um, so uh, as a Red Sox fan do you want to try and do one better than uh, support the Mets of, of why I should pick pick uh, Boston as my team to follow well can I be a little more holistic rather than sort of throwing a team at you on sort of criteria you should look at when you're determining it so you can I, I don't know you well enough to be able to, to pitch you on them I, I think because I think being a supporter is a very personal decision. So I could say why personally I chose the Red Sox, but it would be maybe for different reasons than, than you do. So here are the two factors that I think always kind of play into that decision making. First, do you have any connection to any town, city, 
uh, state in the United States. Because I think that if you have a personal connection to a town or city, that's always the first step. Obviously for Americans, that's really easy. You grew up in a certain town or city, and so you, it, you know, the team represents that. I actually didn't go that way. I grew up in Los Angeles, California, and I chose the Red Sox because I have a personality trait that really reflected the Red Sox in the late 70s and early 80s, which is they were the perennial underdog in a competition against a much bigger team. They played in the American League East against the Yankees, who were consistently during that period and frankly consistent throughout the history of baseball, the best team. I could never root for the best team. That's just not my personality. I love underdogs. It's kind of always how I've always thought of myself and the Red Sox embodied that during that period very much so they weren't terrible but they were always kind of in it but you know kind of disappointed you a little bit they weren't as bad as the cubs because the cubs could have easily met that criteria for me um but they were always kind of in it battling you know gave you reason for hope throughout the whole course of the season but ultimately didn't quite get there the fan base at that time was relatively small so i didn't feel like i was sort of jumping on a bandwagon so that was a personality thing so you need to ask yourself you know what do you like are you a front runner do you like a team that's going to win for you every year and that's somehow self-validating because if you are there's certain teams that would meet that criteria are you like me who likes that sort of team. The Red Sox would no longer be your team if that was the case, obviously. They've now transformed into a, a different type of ball club. And to be quite frank, it makes it harder for me to root for them because they no longer meet that criteria. Do you like lovable losers? Like, is that kind of your thing, right? Do you like, are you a masochist? And you kind of like the pain of your sports team always losing. So look in, in your heart, what is it that makes you excited about supporting a team, about your personality? and use that factor to sort of determine, you know, uh, reverse engineer your choice of teams. That would be my advice rather than mentioning a team and trying to pitch that team. That's, that's a really uh, great way to put it. Like I've never been to, to uh, America. Um, but one thing I was looking at when I was, so I try to make my decisions before leaving it up to the public to decide was I wasn't going to allow my choice be made off a movie because that's how I ended up supporting Miami Dolphins because when I was younger I thought Ace Ventura was brilliant and now I'm lumped with Miami Dolphins and um, so the uh, um, I, I thought let's have a look at beautiful stadiums uh, the underdog thing like I said I'm a Bolton Wonders fan when it comes down to footy so I'm definitely in the masochist uh, field there uh, lovable losers that can tick that box um, and like family what what clubs do for like families so I was thinking like if I do ever get a chance to go to the States and go to a ballpark what's going to be the best sort of family experience so I'm not going to lie I sort of feel myself drifting towards the Padres because I think they've got a nice culture about them from what I've seen I love the stadium and the atmosphere but I don't think I look good in brown <laughs> I'll be honest with you, and I, I may be in the minority. I don't love Petco Field. It's not my favorite. If you want to, and uh, uh, the other factor that I always think about, do you love history? Like a team that has a long history. That was the other reason the Red Sox appealed to me. Like the Seattle Mariners and the Toronto Blue Jays were relatively new teams when I started. I wasn't going to root for them because you didn't have that long history of players who you could look to. So two clubs, uh, one that has a really underrated stadium and I think the city's kind of underrated too are the Pittsburgh Pirates if you like a team that's disappointing right now but has a long history has an amazing stadium the Pirates are a good choice again if you want a team that's sort of in the struggle but you know has some interesting history I like the stadium the city's you know a little raw is are the Detroit Tigers so couple other to consider. Great unis too, the Tigers, and the, and the Pirates for that matter. I actually think uh, both of them have good, good uniforms, so something to ponder. Yeah, definitely. well, Seattle's going to be uh, in contention because it was one of the first games I watched when MLB on 5 launched was the, the Mariners versus the Yankees. So that, that was also another one for consideration. And Seattle's a great, I mean, you want to go to a place that's really fun, Seattle is well worth your time. Great city. You know, I'm not a big fan of the the roofs that close. I feel like it always gives a kind of a claustrophobic feel. So Safeco to me is okay stadium, but not bad. Great food there. They, they serve sushi. So, you know, it's not just the ballpark food. They, uh, you know, kind of elevate a little bit there. So, yeah, uh, definitely worth consideration too. That's fancy. And um, that's pretty much it uh, for us for today. Uh, I always like to leave the, um, the guests with the final words. So, um, 
Josh, you are a fantastic storyteller, um, a superb gentleman, and you're a great host. I can't thank you enough. So um, anything else you'd like to add? Well, first, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, all the people who do podcasts in the UK, I, I'm incredibly supportive of that effort. It's such a great medium uh, to get out the game. And the only thing I would say to your listeners is, uh, you know, find that enthusiasm and love for the sport and try and maintain it for a long time. Uh, and know that you come from a long history of people in Great Britain who have loved this game. It has a greater history than most probably realize uh, and realize that you are part of that lineage and part of that history and keep on moving it forward. Thank you, Josh. Again, um, appreciate your time. I know it's quite early in the morning over there for you. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And, Cheers. Thanks, um, Matt. I look forward to seeing you on my TV soon. Sounds good. <laughs> Take care, my friend. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And that brings us to the end of the show. I'd like to thank Josh again for his time today. I think you'll all agree with me that he was a great guest to have on. Uh, a lot of insight into the game and uh, just a really nice guy all around. Really enjoyed listening to him talk about baseball and uh, all the bits in between. And um, hopefully... We'll have another guest on for next week. Uh, any feedback they want to give, again, please feel free to contact me on social media. Um, if you don't know where I am, I'm at Brit Baseball Pod. Or you can get me on the email, like I said, start show, British Baseball Podcast at gmail.com. I uh, must send an apology to Earl. He did send me a question and uh, I didn't get it until after I finished recording. Um, so I am sorry I did pass it on and uh, if it does respond to everybody's answer I'll, uh, I'll let you know the feedback but thank you again for your kind words and that'll, uh, that'll see us out so have a good one ta -ra.